Hey everybody, this is an assembly guide for the DIY kit of the Pico Vortex. If you don't know what that is, check out the review I made on it here. So here are the things you'll be getting in the box. The 3D printer enclosure if you bought the kit with one, a bag of all the parts in it, the PCB, and the top FR4 plate. The bag with all the parts in it is pretty hard to open. All the parts are taped on, and uh, I don't really like that. But yeah, once you get everything out, you should have two aluminum knobs, two knob encoders, four spacers, four rubber feet, four stabilizer housings, four stabilizer stems, two stabilizer wires, one raspberry pico, seven hot swap sockets, four long screws, four hex nuts, four white keycaps, two black keycaps, one blue keycap, seven gator on yellow switches, and one plastic alignment thing. And here are the tools you'll need. Note that some of these are optional. A screwdriver, a soldering iron, a solder sucker if you make any mistakes, solder, solder tin to keep your solder tip clean, flux, solder sponge to keep your solder tip clean, and nose pliers. The flux rosin I'm using is hard at room temperature, so I use my soldering iron to melt it and use a pair of tweezers to grab some while it's cooling down. This is kinda scuffed, but it works. First, we're going to apply flux on the pins that hold the raspberry pickle. This is an optional step. I melt the flux on my tweezers onto the pads. We'll be soldering those three through hole pads too, so I've added flux there. And this should be how it looks like when it's all done. Now time for soldering. Put some solder on the tip of your soldering iron and put some solder on the V-Bus pad. Then get out the Raspberry Pico and place it on the PCB. Here, we'll be using the plastic alignment piece provided. Slot it into the two holes on the Pico. It should pass through the other side of the PCB. This will help us keep the Pico aligned above the pads. Make sure that your Pico's USB port is pointing to the right. If you get this wrong, nothing will work. I shifted the Pico around to make sure that every pin on the Pico is above the pads correctly. And when that's all good, I put my soldering iron on the V-Bus pad that had the solder on it to solder the pad to the correct pin on the Pico. After that, I added more solder to the top to solder the pin to the board. Next, flip the board over and add solder to those three through hole pads. You should wiggle your soldering iron a little here so that the solder properly goes through the hole and solders the pickle on the other side. I accidentally added too much solder, so I desoldered it with my solder sucker and tried again. Repeat the same step for the rest of the through hole pads. Now we're going to test the board. If everything is done correctly, windows will detect it. If it isn't detected at all, your V-Bus or your ground pin isn't soldered correctly. The ground pin is one of the three pins we soldered earlier. If you get this error, it means that one of the three solder joints isn't soldered properly. Heat the solder up and try flowing them again. If everything is working, head to the GitHub page and download the firmware. Extract the zip to somewhere like your desktop. Open the Build UF2 folder and drag and drop the firmware into the Pico. It'll disconnect and reconnect as a sound vortex controller. When that's all good, unplug the controller and now we'll be soldering the rest of the pads. Sorry for the bad angle, my only cameraman is a tripod stand. But yeah, anyway, to solder these pads, press your soldering iron against the pico and push your solder wire into your soldering iron. This should solder the pads nicely. Repeat for all the pads. The pads and the pins are large, so flux isn't really needed here to be honest. Repeat for the other side as well. And don't forget about three pins at the sides too. And this should be how it looks like when you're done. To get rid of the flux on the PCB, I use isopropyl alcohol wipes to clean it. Cleaning off flux when you're done soldering is good practice. All clean now. Flipping over to the other side, it looks like there's flux and solder poking through those holes. Some of the holes have too much solder, so I decided to do a bit of desoldering. To be honest, this is optional and I did it because I wanted the board to look cleaner. Then I cleaned the flux off again. Next, 
Next is the knob encoders. Insert the bottom three pins first, then snap the encoders into the holes. This is going to take a bit of force and time. Repeat for the other encoder. Then flip the PCB around and it's time to solder again. Place your soldering iron at the pin and press your solder wire against it to flow solder into the pad. Repeat for all the holes. Then do this for the other knob encoder as well. And now it's time to test the PCB again. If everything has been soldered on correctly, the lights should turn on. Go to the Gamepad Tester website. Turn the knobs and check if the knobs are working. Then use a pair of tweezers and press against the pads for the buttons to test if those work too. The LEDs should also light up if they are working. Time to solder on the hot swap sockets. Add a bit of solder to one of the pads for all of them. Then put on the solder socket and heat up the pad that you added solder on. The socket should be flush with the PCB. Then add some solder onto the other side of the pad. Repeat this for the rest of the sockets. For the fourth socket I was soldering, I accidentally soldered it upside down. Luckily I noticed it when I only soldered one side. To remove it, I heated up one side while pulling the socket out with a tweezer. I turned it back to the right direction and soldered again. To be safe, I added more solder to all of the socket pads. This isn't written in the guide, but I decided to plug it in again and test if the buttons were working. Insert the switches into each of the sockets. If you press them, they should light up. Next are the stabilizers. These are plate mounted stabilizers. Be sure that the stabilizer stem has a hole at the top like this. When you insert it into the stabilizer housing, your stabilizer should look like this from the bottom. Then, insert the stabilizer wire into the housing. Make sure it passes through the stem inside as well. Then press the wire into the clip at the side. It should snap in. Repeat this process for the other side. If you've done it correctly, the other side of the stabilizer should rise if one of the side stem is pulled. Repeat all of this for the other stabilizer. Time to insert the stabilizers into the top FR4 plate. Insert the bottom of the wire like this. The wire should go under the plate. The plastic bits sticking out of the stabilizer housing should line up with the cutout hole on the plate. Then snap the stabilizers in. I noticed the tolerances of the plate for mine were too tight and no matter what I did, I couldn't snap it in. I ended up getting sandpaper and sanding the plate so the holes were big enough. Only after all of that that I could snap them in. I had to repeat the sanding thing for the other side too. With the stabilizers done, go back to the PCB and add the four white spaces at the corners. I noticed for the top left corner, the screw hole didn't line up with the spacer's hole. This is okay though. Put the FR4 plate over. For the hole that wasn't aligned properly, you have to manually screw the screw in. It's a tight fit, but you can do it. Put the screws in for the rest of the holes. They should fall through. If you have a 3D printed enclosure, place the entire thing into it. Make sure the screws go through the holes into the corners of the enclosure as well. Screw on the hex nut on the other side of the enclosure for now. You don't really need to do it really tight. You just need to do this to make sure the screws don't fall while we add the rubber feet on later. Now it's time to add on the rubber feet. Unscrew all the nuts and add the rubber feet over the screw. Then put the hex nut into the rubber feet. This is the annoying part, but yeah, use a screwdriver to hold the screw on the other side of the controller and tighten the hex nut with a nose plier like this. Turn clockwise to tighten. Turn anti-clockwise to untighten. I couldn't unscrew some of the nuts with my hand because it kept turning the screw on the other side. To unscrew them, use a screwdriver to hold the screw on the other side and then use a nose plier to undo the nut. One of the ways to screw in the nut quicker is to hold the hex nut with the nose pliers and stay still, but turn the screwdriver in the screw on the other side. This will tighten the nut on the other side, but it won't work on the screw next to one of the encoders that you had to manually screw in earlier. Repeat the same process for the rest of the feet.
Next up is the knobs. As you can see, one of the sides of the knob encoders is flat. The screw in the knob is supposed to press against this. Make sure you align the screw to the flat side of the knob encoder and then screw it in. After that, put in your switches and keycaps and you're good to go. If one of the switches don't work, that could mean one or more of the pins on the switches is bent. Pull the switch out of the controller and check. If it's bent like this, use a tweezer or a flat plier to bend it back straight and put it back into the controller. And that's it. Enjoy your new controller and thank you for watching.